Hey, welcome to our roundup of all the callbacks, secrets, Easter eggs, and references in Avengers Endgame. And it's all spoiler free. No, wait, reverse that. Actually, this entire video is just one big spoiler. If someone you know hasn't seen Endgame, sending them this video might actually kill them. Don't do it. Endgame is the culmination of over a decade of MCU films, so as you'd probably expect, it's loaded with callbacks to earlier films. A big chunk of the movie is actually set within previous Marvel movies. Thanks to the wonders of time travel, Endgame returns us to three classic MCU locations from other films at the exact same time those prior events were taking place, and the Russo brothers thoughtfully reassemble those old ensemble cast to make it happen. That was nice of them. Right? So we go back to 2012 New York as it appeared in the original The Avengers, 2013 Asgard as it was originally featured in Thor The Dark World, and 2014 Planet Morag just as it looked in the original Guardians of the galaxy. We also stopped by New Jersey's Camp Lehigh in the year 1970 when it was serving as a shield base. This place is hugely significant in MCU history. It's the military base where Steve Rogers trained prior to receiving Dr. Erskine's super serum, and it's the location of the secret bunker where Black Widow and Cap discovered the preserved brain of Hydra scientist Arnim Zola during Winter Soldier. I am not a recording, Fräulein. But no single Marvel movie gets more Endgame love than the one that really started the whole phenomenon, 2008's Iron Man. Endgame opens with an emaciated Tony in a black tank top, trapped and scared for his life, which is also how we found him during his Afghanistan captivity in the original movie. Happy tells Tony's daughter Morgan about her dad's love of cheeseburgers, which is also an Iron Man callback. That was the first item that Tony requested after being freed from his terrorist captors. Hogan, what on earth drive. For? Cheeseburger first. That proof Tony Stark has a heart arc reactor collectible, which now rests upon a commemorative wreath, was a gift that Pepper gave him in the first movie. Of course, Tony's big closing line before he defeats Thanos recalls the final words he speaks in his first movie. I am Iron Man. Finally, Endgame is the first MCU movie without a mid or post credit sequence. As the final Marvel Studio logo comes up, just before the lights come on, we hear a familiar clang on the soundtrack. It's the sound of Tony fashioning his first Iron Man mask, still stuck in an Afghan cave. But Tony's not the only Avenger feeling a bit misty and nostalgic for bygone times. Almost every character in the film has some kind of wink or nod to their personal backstories. As they zip through space, Clint tells Natasha that they're a long way from Budapest. This was their infamous and still mysterious Joint Shield mission that the duo first discussed during the Battle of New York in the first Avengers. Just like Budapest all over again. You and I remember Budapest very differently. What happened in Budapest? Is this the setup for the coming Black Widow spin-off adventure? Just before she sacrifices herself on Vormir to obtain the Soul Stone, Natasha tells Clint that she refuses to judge him based on his worst actions because you didn't. This is a way back callback to the first Avengers team-up film. That was when we found out that Clint has been sent by S.H.I.E.L.D. to assassinate Natasha, a notorious KGB agent, but ultimately ended up recruiting her. An entire scene pivots around a potential close-up fight with Captain America in an elevator, which was the setup for an extremely memorable scene in Winter Soldier. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Many of the same characters overlap in both sequences. That was, by the way, the first Marvel film for Endgame directors Joe and Anthony Russo, so naturally it deserved a little love. Note that during the elevator scene, in order to get Loki's scepter away from Jasper Sitwell, Cap leans in and says, Hail Hydra. This is not only a clever ploy, as future Cap already knows that Sitwell is a double agent, but a sly reference to Captain America comics. In a controversial 2017 storyline, Cap has false memories implanted in his head that made him believe he'd been recruited by Hydra years before. During his fight with his double, Avengers 1 Captain America said he could do this all day. That's what a much younger and frailer Steve said to a bully who was beating him up in an alley in First Avenger. I can do this all day. He also referenced this line when fighting Iron Man in Civil War. When all the backup, previously dusted Avengers show up for the big fight, Falcon announces their arrival by saying, on your left. 
This was, of course, what Steve used to annoy him while they were jogging through Washington, D.C. in Winter Soldier. Ah, uh, simpler times. On your left. Uh-huh, on my left. Got it. Cap and Bucky also referenced their memorable pre-war parting banter from First Avenger. Before Cap leaves for a final time jump, he tells Bucky, Don't do anything stupid until I get back. How can I? Taking all the stupid with you. And then of course, Cap finally gets to say his big line, Avengers Assemble. This got teased at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron, but the movie cut off before he could actually say the words. Avengers! By the way, anyone else notice that Wasp calls him Cap in this movie? She made fun of Scott for doing that very same thing back in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Cap, it's, it's what we call him. Also, little fun detail, the new Asgard community has been constructed in the town of Tonsberg, Norway. This was where Odin, Thor, and Loki had their final chat in Thor Ragnarok. Odin instructed his sons to remember this place and called it home. This film had so many callbacks, in fact, that both the opening and closing songs serve as references. The film opens on the Benatar with Tony and Nebula listening to the 1967 traffic song, Dear Mr. Fantasy. The lyrics, of course, have some relevance to the movie. It's asking for an entertaining hero to come along and bring everyone out of this gloom, just like Tony in the movie. But it's also notable for dating back much earlier than most of Star-Lord's music collection that we've heard. That's because in Guardians 2, he got his hands on a Microsoft Zune with over 300 songs. Dear Mr. Fantasy must have been among them. The film ends with the 1940 staple, It's Been a Long, Long Time. This tune was previously featured in Winter Soldier when Nick Fury visited Steve in his apartment. It also has some thematic relevance. I mean, for Steve, it really has been a long, long time. He's been waiting for that dance longer than we've been waiting for this movie. Lots of cameos and riffs on pop culture to pick apart in Endgame as well, including the first ever character to debut on a Marvel TV show and then later make it into an MCU film. That distinction goes to James Darcy, who portrayed Howard Stark's driver Edwin Jarvis on TV's Agent Carter and shows up in this film's 1970s sequence in the same role. This Jarvis, of course, inspired the name of Tony Stark's computerized Jarvis, who then later inspired the creation of an android who was not named Jarvis, but Vision, who's still dead. Try to keep up. Anyone catch that lone young man standing by himself at Tony Stark's funeral? That was actor Ty Simpkins as Harley Keener, the 10-year-old Tennessee kid who helped Tony out in Iron Man 3. Not Reed Richards. A guy next to me at the theater thought it might be Reed Richards. Sorry, mm -hmm. dude. Co-director Joe Russo has done cameos in all of his MCU movies, and this one's no different. He was the guy at the support group early on who poured out his heart about his recent date to Steve. The late, great Marvel legend Stan Lee had his customary cameo as an impolite 1970s New Jersey motorist. Rumor has it that this is the second to last appearance and he'll make his final cameo in this summer's Spider-Man Far From Home. We'll miss you, Generalissimo. Finally, we got not one, but two cameos from the sitcom community. Ken Jeong and Yvette Nicole Brown both showed up as security guards. Finally, the film referenced a lot of previous time travel movies, including Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, whoa, <gasps> but none more frequent than Back to the Future 2. The movies actually share a few things in common. They're both concerned with the creation of a dark dystopian alternate timeline, and they both feature memorable scenes where characters time travel, then hide and observe their past selves. Ant-Man makes the connection official, though, when he instructs his fellow Avengers not to bet on any sporting events. This is Biff Tannen's evil plan that creates an alternate crime-ridden Hill Valley. Also, fun fact, composer Alan Silvestri worked on the scores for both the Back to the Future series and Avengers Endgame. That's the power of love. Most of these MCU films are riddled with riffs and references back to the comics, but this time around we're wrapping things up, so they kept it a bit lighter. 
Bruce's new Professor Hulk persona comes straight out of the books where he occasionally decided that the best solution is to merge his two personalities into one new being. Just as in the film, the Professor, or Merged Hulk, has a relatively normal looking head that resembles Bruce Banner, but a huge green Hulk body. Notably, as Bruce engineered this version of the Hulk to return to his human form when he gets too angry, this is the weakest form of the Hulk. During the 1970s S.H.I.E.L.D. sequence, we briefly visit Hank Pym's office, where he's still got the original old-school Ant-Man helmet on his desk. Still working out the kinks, I guess. It doesn't seem super practical. Also, Tony's daughter Morgan Stark borrows her name from a comics character. The original Morgan Stark was Tony's evil cousin who was constantly scheming to get Stark Industries away from him. In Infinity War, Tony told Pepper he had a dream about having a child who would be named after Pepper's crazy uncle Morgan. We named him after your eccentric uncle. Uh, what was his name? Right. Morgan. So they swap families, but the name is the same. And the craziness. Also in Tokyo, we see Clint battling a Yakuza named Akihiko. This character faced off against Nick Fury in Marvel Comics. It's entirely possible that these movies are building to some kind of variation on the comic book team, The Young Avengers. We've got several possible candidates already in the mix. Early on, Clint trains his daughter in archery and even uses the nickname Hawkeye to refer to her. In Young Avengers comics, Hawkeye Jr. is named Kate Bishop, but it's possible the movies may be going another way with it. I wonder if we'll learn more about Hawkeye Jr. and Hawkeye's upcoming Disney Plus series. Plus, Scott's daughter Cassie Lang has grown up a bit and appears to be nearing potential superhero age. In the comics, she becomes the hero Stature and later Stinger through the use of Pym Particle technology. Bear in mind the comic book Young Avengers also feature a hero named Kid Loki, who is just Loki trapped in the body of a young boy following a resurrection-related accident. Please, Marvel, put this in a movie. And speaking of Loki, in one of the film's past timelines, we see him grab a loose tesseract and take off with it into a portal to parts unknown. Now, the heroes end up getting around this by going back even further in time and swiping an older version of the tesseract, but do we definitely know what happened to the version of Loki who escaped? Seems like he could really do some damage unstuck in time and armed with a space stone. Is this the setup for the Disney Plus series? We're also left with the possibility at the end of this film that Thor is going to be fighting alongside the Guardians for the time being. Is it possible he might be joining the team full time? Will Hemsworth appear in Guardians 3? Or will he be needed back on Earth where the new Captain America is just a normal man with a jetpack? And what happened to past timeline Gamora that Quill can't seem to find? Did she return to her own timeline or is she off having an adventure of her own? And let's talk about Peter Parker's high school. A closing shot reveals that his pal Ned apparently was also snapped and thus will still attend high school with Peter. Actually, the Far From Home trailer seems to indicate that Peter's entire high school class, including MJ and Flash Thompson, are all still in high school after the five-year time jump. So they all got snapped together? That was convenient. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Steve Rogers ends the film as an old man wearing a wedding ring. The clear assumption is that after going back in time, Steve hooked back up with Peggy Carter and they built a life together. But we learned in Winter Soldier when Steve visited an elderly Peggy Carter that she had gotten married to someone else and started a family. Did Steve ruin this guy's entire life? Or, and I don't want to blow your minds here, was the other guy actually Steve all along and Peggy just couldn't say anything? Time travel. Okay, that is a ton of information and I really want to go see this movie again, so let's wrap it up here. If you found amazing, incredible Endgame references that we missed, hit us up below and let us hear about it.